Well, now I'd like to come to the last part of the talk, and I'd like to spend a little bit more time on that, and that is um, the use of volcanic rocks in agriculture and gardening. So we talked about primitive housing, concrete supplements, abrasives, but I really like to focus on this a little more. So let's uh, look at this. Volcanic particles and volcanic soils are extremely fertile, and this is exploited in many parts of the world. You can grow wine at Etna or in the Auvergne in France, which is a volcanic area, or these ones here, these wines from Gran Canaria. And um, let me go back to Indonesia for a minute. Indonesia has volcanoes, and it's got a lot of rainfall. It's tropical, and therefore it's got all the things that are needed. It's got the volcanic soil and the water to grow things. So here's a little thunderstorm in Indonesia, and you see there's a lot of water there. And it allows to grow all these amazing things. <coughs> For good reason, um, these areas were the spice islands of the past, because you can grow chili peppers and all these kind of things. And they grow because there's water, there's warm climate, and volcanic soil. Let me point out that coffee is done in the same way. 70% of all coffee is grown on volcanic soil. So when you drink coffee in the morning, most probably your coffee has touched volcano at some point. And uh, here's a map of domestic coffee consumption. And where I come from, northern Europe, here's Sweden, we drink a lot of coffee, probably because of the lack of sunshine. And um, further south, coffee is less intensely consumed. But uh, here in the north, coffee is uh, really, really popular. And this means we're bringing the coffee from warm volcanic areas. We're importing it to the colder areas on the planet. So here's a few insights from a coffee plantation in East Java that I visited a little while ago. So here they use these larger trees in order to give shape to the coffee plants. And here you have some berries. And uh, eventually, they are collected and they are sorted. And uh, here's the beans. And they're actually white. They're dried and then they're roasted, which gives you then the final product, ground or not. Many people prefer to grind the coffee themselves these days, but that's the process. Now, chocolate is also often grown on volcanic soil. Here's some uh, cocoa beans um, that uh, come from Indonesia. This is actually at the slopes of Merapi volcano as well. They grow really well there. And uh, some companies exploit that. The most famous chocolate um, bar in Iceland is actually called, called Lava. And um, it hints at this uh, connection to volcanic soils. And several other brands are exploiting this as well. But I don't think the connection between chocolate and volcanoes is all that well known. Tea is very similar. A lot of tea is actually grown on volcanic soil. Tea needs high altitude, and it needs a certain level of moisture. But it also needs very fertile soil, which is often given at volcanoes. So here I've got a very special plant for you, and this is also a big cash crop, although not everybody has seen it in this shape. Many uh, people are not quite sure. When I ask my students, what do you think that plant is, then most people struggle with this. So this is when it's young as seedlings. This is when it's flowering. And this is when it's getting more mature. And this is what we do with this. This is tobacco. And um, tobacco has been grown on La Palma, for example, for a long time. Winston Churchill smoked La Palma cigars. But these days, smoking is less fashionable. But tobacco is still important because uh, we use nicotine, uh, for example, as a pesticide, as a natural pesticide. And it's partly also used as a fertilizer for certain things. So we still need tobacco. And uh, even though we don't smoke it quite so much anymore as a society, but tobacco is still grown in many parts of the world. And volcanic soil is very good for it. So now we've talked about the combination of a moist, humid climate and uh, uh, volcanoes. And that's all good and well. But in the, in, in the Canaries, often, we have the volcano part, but we don't have a lot of water here. So this makes it a little difficult. The little volcanic stones, they're called pecan locally. And um, um, this is something that uh, is produced during volcanic eruptions, like here, 1971, on La Palma. And these are the deposits. And 
this and what you can do with it. You can roll things in them. So this is widely used, not just as a building supplement, but also as an agricultural supplement. And I'd like to explore this a little bit. Now, as I said, um, when you're in the dry areas here, the Sahara, the Canary Islands are just about here. This is more difficult. In Indonesia, there's a lot of uh, water. There's a tropical climate. Here, we're in the dry area. So what we have here is the volcanic stones, but very little water. And it all started on Lanzarote. Lanzarote is beautiful, but it has very little water. This is a tiny little coastal lagoon, but as soon as you go inland, this is the Timanfaya National Park, there's very little water. It's super dry there. But in 1730, a big eruption happened on Lanzarote. It started with big earthquakes, and um, after a while, the eruption started in mid-1730, and the Spanish king was very concerned, and he sent one of his best men, and this was Bishop Davila. And uh, he was sent to observe the situation. So the bishop arrived, and uh, he was uh, very concerned about the population. He uh, initiated evacuations, and uh, many of the people were sent to the neighboring islands without volcanic eruptions, and uh, most of the villages concerned were evacuated within a year. And um, the bishop was staying on the island, continuing his observations. Here's an old oil painting of what happened. This is the outline of Lanzarote. And there's a record of where the vents opened up. And uh, this uh, shows which of the vents were active at what point. So we have a great record from these um, old uh, notes that were made at the time. And there was one fundamental observation by the bishop. He realized when there's thick ash cover, the plants die. But when there's a thin ash cover, the plants start to bloom. And this was fundamental. So the eruption actually lasted uh, six years, and 23% of Lanzarote was covered with lava and ash. But after the eruption, the villagers returned, and the bishop recommended that they use little volcanic particles to fertilize their fields. And this has led to a revolution. And you've probably seen it if you have taken a day trip. There's this area here, La Guerilla, and uh, this is where volcanic particles are brought out into the fields, and it allows them there to actually grow all sorts of things. Prior to that, only cereal was possible. After the 1736 eruption, suddenly wine was possible, fruit was possible. So there's something secret about volcanic particles in agriculture. And uh, now these round little walls here, I should point out, they are there to protect the plants from the wind. They don't help the plants grow. They're just protection. But the volcanic particles that are put on the soil they do miracles for the plants. So here's a few more impressions, and uh, all sorts of plants can be grown. Here's a fresh field to be planted, and here is a lot of uh, grapes being grown to make wine. And you see there's large areas that are um, worked in this way these days, and the entire uh, valley here is full with these kind of little um, depressions into which the plants are set and it allows to make superb wine. So here you can see this valley here. It's filled up with artificial uh, black volcanic particles, or this one here. The entire flanks of the valley are full with it. So what happened on Lanzarote was the population doubled within a few decades after that because suddenly it could sustain a much larger population density. And um, it led to the wines from Lanzarote being quite famous. And at the Vienna Congress in 1816, actually Lanzarote wine was on the menu. It was considered one of the finest. But later there was um, a pest and the wines died. But uh, Lanzarote wine is coming back right now. And maybe some of you had a chance to test some Lanzarote wine when we were on the island. So there is a price to be paid, and that is uh, you have to quarry these particles, and it leaves some scars in the landscape. So here's an old quarry, here's an active quarry. <coughs> and um, for the geoscientists, this is ugly. 
So you can see that the volcanic land fronts are not pristine, but this is the price that needs to be paid. And uh, here's a large industrial quarry on Gran Canaria where um, the lapilli, the little pecan material is uh, quarried. And here you have pecan hydrophonical, if you can just about read it, it's the one for gardening. Pecan normal is for agriculture and then it's uh, put on lorries and it's brought out to the field. And it produces these scars here. These are old quarry sites here, still an active one. And uh, this was quarried. It's now um, no longer allowed to quarry these two places. They are now protected areas. But the damage is partly done and I'll take you to this site here now. So this is a photo I retrieved from the archives in Las Palmas. And this was the volcanic cone in 1906. And this is the volcanic cone today. And this is uh, me visiting with some of my students. And uh, there's an open site now. Now, for geologists, this is not completely bad because you can kind of look inside the volcano, but pretty low. So, and a few words now about the other islands. And uh, Tenerife has a lot of lapilli as well, these pecan particles. This is an image of the 1798 eruption, which happened in this area here. And there's volcanic vents all along the different axes. And in the lower part of the island, it's uh, very fertile. So uh, there, the soils are supplemented with these particles, allowing to grow bananas and, of course, wine. So here's a few of those alignments of cones. This is from this area down here. And these can be quarried and uh, the particles can be used for that. In some areas, pumice stone is more uh, pronounced than uh, the basaltic particles, the dark particles. So locally, pumice stone is used for the same purpose. And uh, here you see quarries in pumice stone and the pumice stone is used to make these terraces. This is a very peculiar site on uh, Tenerife. This is one volcanic cone, and it has multiple quarries in there. And I was very confused when I saw this the first time, so I investigated. It turned out that the volcano was owned in slices by different people, and each of them made their own quarry. So, um, yeah, what can you say? That's economy for you. So, um, therefore, there is now a star-shaped volcano with quarries there on Tenerife. So, I mentioned this before, um, the quarrying is very intense, and uh, when Humboldt went to Tenerife in 1799, he described three cones inside the beautiful Orotava Valley. Today, we only see one and a half. Here's one, and this is half. It was partly quarried. There's a hotel here, and there's a little church bell tower here. The other one, the third one, is gone, and it's been completely dug away. So a few words about La Palma Island, the island with the most frequent eruptions in historical times. And uh, here's a few impressions. This is from the 1971 eruption. And here you see how these volcanic particles are formed. They're blown out of the vents, and they pile up. They're quite loose, so it's easy to quarry them. And uh, here we have the vent alignment on top of the island. This is this area here, the Cumbre Vieja. And it's basically big piles of volcanic particles. And uh, you can quarry them. And here we have the Cumbre Vieja. And there's lava that comes down all the way. And it makes these platforms. And what the local people do is they take the volcanic particles from here and they move them onto the new lava platforms and they put greenhouses on top. So the 1949 lava platform, not even 100 years old, it's full with greenhouses and fields because it's warm and they have the volcanic soil. So coastal platforms are fantastic for this. This is an image from 1949 when the platform formed. This is today, and it's full of greenhouses and fields. And this is the same for the 5085 platform, the 1712 platform, etc., etc. And many of the local people now on La Palma want the new lava platform from 2021 to become fields as well, to bring more money to the island. But the government is a bit reluctant, so there's a bit of a dispute going on right now. 
We will have to see what happens there. So, this is what I pointed out. This is these platforms here in the lower part, and you can see how green they are. And this is where a lot of agriculture happens, and the volcanic material is basically brought from here, and it's put onto here, and it allows the agriculture to flourish. So, what is the power of pecan? What is the power of these volcanic particles? Well, it has to do with the moisture to a large degree, and uh, Humboldt described this first in 1799. What we have in the Canaries is these cloud formations, the sea of clouds. There is not a lot of rainfall here, but there is these clouds, and they, um, they cause dew, particularly early in the morning and at certain times of the year, and this is part of the secret here. So this is going back to Humboldt. It's very fertile in the lower parts of the islands, and it, can, it gets less fertile higher up. We have this arrangement of trees a little bit into the middle altitude of the island, and uh, here we have to think about that. It's the precipitation from these clouds. It's not rainfall directly that allows to do these things. And the Corona Forestal is a stretch of forest, of pine forest. Here's a, an example of it. Uh, in this altitude level, about um, 1,000 meters to about 2,000 meters above sea level, and this is where the sea of clouds comes in. And the pines here, they catch the moisture from the clouds, and this is something that the particles, the pecan, can do as well. So this goes back to this kind of little story about the holy tree on El Hierro, the Garahoy. And when the Spaniards came to conquer the island, they pushed the local inhabitants into the mountains, into the dry mountains. They believed that the locals will basically die of thirst in the mountains. But the locals had a secret. It was this tree here, the Garahoy tree. And the Garahoy was catching moisture from the clouds, and the water was dripping down, and they had a little pond there where they collected it, and it allowed them to drink. And the locals survived uh, for many years up in the mountains, unknown to the Spanish conquerors, who were mainly at the base level of the island. And this was a hotel room I stayed in for a little while uh, during some field work a few years ago. And one afternoon, we got a delivery of pecan for gardening. And the next morning, I looked at it, and you could see all the, the water that has come out of the particles. It looked entirely dry when it was delivered. So these particles, they store a lot of moisture. And that's the trick. They can suck up the moisture from the clouds, and they store the moisture in the little bubbles inside these particles. And I had a student investigating this a little bit further. This is some images with the electron microscope. Here, this is one micrometer. It's super tiny. And here's one of those little bubbles. And what we found in there is microorganisms. So not only is there water in there, there's actually life in these volcanic particles. And this life sustains itself from breaking down the volcanic rock. And it eats all sorts of things, sulfur, I guess, and um, etc. And this brings more carbon to the soil. So there is not just water being stored, there's actually more life in the soil. And living soil is good for plants. So here's a few more examples. I don't want to go into the details. They're all listed here. And there is um, a few handouts over there of various articles. If you're interested, please feel free to, to take some. There we talk in detail about what kind of organisms live there. And uh, here, the important thing is that the rocks bring all these nutrients and they bring living soil. And this is really good. That's the secret of the volcanic particles. And this is why agriculture has profited so much from that. Now, a little outlook just at the very end. And this is that uh, we all know we have these problems. Um, we have too much CO2 in the atmosphere. And uh, there is big imbalances. And uh, here's just a little diagram. And um, here is one of the important things. Volcanic particles that have microorganisms in them, they will actually bind CO2. So there's the opportunity for us to 
reshift this balance a little bit, and it's been estimated that uh, we could potentially reduce our CO2 emissions by something like 20% if we were to use volcanic particles more widely. So this is an estimate of how much we could potentially uh, keep in the ground, and these numbers could be discussed. I don't know how good they are, but this is done for different countries, and it ranges from 5% to maybe 20%, but here we have a cheap way, without a lot of fuss, to potentially lock a lot of CO2 in the ground and produce more crops and therefore feed more people. So this might allow us to make a huge difference and here in these dry areas, particularly in the Sahara and the Canary Islands, it worked really well. And therefore, I think we could potentially think about making those areas here, the really dry ones, green in the future. Thank you very much.